Hello, everybody. This is Soren Davis at CAQH, and welcome to the second showing uh, of our provider directory presentation to the provider community in Massachusetts. This was hosted not only by CAQH, but with the support and getting this together of the Massachusetts Medical Society and the Massachusetts Hospital Association. So with that, I think we can get started on the presentation. Uh, what I wanted to do is give everyone a sense of what we will be covering today. With me, my colleague uh, Ruth Buenafor is here who will actually do a live demo of the directory maintenance solution that the payers in uh, Massachusetts have aligned around. But before that, we're also going to give you some of the context and backdrop of what led to this situation. It is not unique to Massachusetts. Although Massachusetts, by coming together and being collaborative and transparent in terms of working together to solve this problem, are actually uh, on one level also serving almost as a pilot for the rest of the nation to see how payers, providers, and other stakeholders working together collaboratively on solving a common problem in a common way can actually significantly move the meter uh, of the directory data quality situation that everybody throughout the country is currently facing. So you'll get a little background of the key drivers, how it all started, how CAQH is approaching solving this problem, and then you will actually see the solution, and then we'll entertain some Q&A. Okay, so to start with, what are the challenges that most people have been facing? And we look at that both from the provider and the health plan perspective. For providers, it's been pretty consistent. They're being asked the same information over and over again by different plans. Um, we have data that shows nationally a typical provider has anywhere from 10 to 15 relationships that require data. Typically about uh, seven to 10 of them are health plans. And the current process is each plan through its own channels reaches out and asks for confirming information. If you're the provider, you're receiving that same request seven to 10 different times. Coupled with there are regulatory requirements both at the federal and the state level that dictate the frequency of that outreach. So not only do you get seven touches, but you will get those seven touches, of course, seven to 10 touches uh, every 90 days because those are regulatory requirements from the um, regulators out there. Um, there's also, because it's unique communication channels, very data submission requirements, even though the goal is the same, people will ask for similar information in slightly different ways. And there is a lack of standardized questions, which very much ties to the above one as well, which means that people have to decipher what is it exactly that somebody is looking for. So we know these are provided three, and there are many others, but they're the three big ones. Health plans, on the other hand, have a similar set of problems. First and foremost is they don't necessarily have the correct contact information to ask these questions and to do this outreach. That has proved a bit of a challenge. Providers do not always respond. Certainly, if you get inundated with enough requests, you're gonna to start to tune this out you become desensitized to the importance, and so it becomes harder and harder to collect this data, which by the way, typically results in them plans increasing their outreach because they have this regulatory overlay that they have to comply with, so they have to make contact. And last but not least is incomplete information. Because there is no standardization, what happens is you wind up potentially not as a plan getting the information you need. All of this leads to a lot of questions, touch points, work effort, 
and does not necessarily, and in fact we know that in the current process, does not support the need for accurate and complete directory information. Next slide, please. So to give you a sense of where all this started, um, at the federal level, which is where CA2H started, and then we go and support state requirements as well, but the federal level has been very heavily involved in this process. And what you have on this slide is just a sense of the different pieces of legislation and regulation that have been put forth by the feds in the last three years, all of which either focus almost exclusively or have embedded in them requirements and expectations around how you maintain directory data. Most of this is focused on the plans having to do this. However, without the provider engagement as the source for a lot of this information, it's next to impossible to be compliant. So CAQH monitors this very closely and is looking at a solution and has built a solution that really tries to meet the requirements enumerated in all of these different regulations. Next slide, please. What I wanted to share with you now is some of the details around how the feds have specifically not only put out regulations, as you saw before, but they are actually auditing the quality of payer directories. And they do this with a secret shopper-like model. They will take plans, existing plans directory, and this is on the MA front. So right now you're seeing data for the um, Medicare Advantage plans, but this is certainly when it gets to the state level, begins to expand beyond that into the commercial space. And candidly for the industry, this needs to be solved as a totality, not just a specific line of business. Um, where we have the most data though has been as a result of these CMS audits. These have now happened for the past three years. And I think as you can see from these charts, in the first round, data quality was pretty poor. Okay, basically you were dealing with, uh, you know, 45 to 50% bad data. In round two, a year later, and ironically after payers in particular, but other folks were sensitized to the problem and began to actually develop solutions and attempt to correct this, the individual organization attempts did not prove fruitful. In fact, in that second audit, the error rate went up slightly. Some of that is probably due to sampling size errors on the data and some tweaks that CMS did. Bottom line, though, is the data pretty much was still inaccurate in round two. And round three produced the same results. This actually became alarming to everybody, including CMS, because they were not seeing improvement. Okay, What we did at CAQH, we got challenged actually in round one, at the end of round one, to look at can we develop an industry-wide solution to this problem that the payers can all work with. The assumption was, and correctly so, we believe, that CA2H had already made great inroads with the provider community through its ProView database to connect up. That database, as most of you know, was used for credentialing data but that platform can be leveraged and modified to also support a director use case. The key feature is the provider community knows it and uses it regularly. Just for those that don't know, nationally there are more than one and a half million providers in using the ProView platform today and over a thousand organizations access it for the data that those providers supply. So this is a proven solution that connects up to people and that is embedded in many providers' workflows already. Next slide, please. Okay, what you now have from CMS after the third audit round is really some of their observations and commentary. 
Okay, CMS still believes that the payers are the organizations in the best position to ensure accuracy of the provided data. Um, and I think that the payers have stepped up to that and accept that responsibility. CMS has also recognized that this is a complicated process and requires all parties to play in it. So there is a recognition that this kind of information is dependent on providers, even though the payers are the ones now challenged to manage this. And this has real impact downstream because the regulations have penalties associated with this. CMS has not triggered those penalties because they recognize now the complexity and in fact are now also not only recognizing the complexity, but starting to articulate that they believe a centralized repository is probably the key component that is missing in the industry. We certainly echo that because that has been our model and that is in fact what we are deploying in Massachusetts at the market level. So our, our vision for this is really market-based solutions, but all leveraging a common platform, common standards, so that what happens in New Jersey or in New York or in Massachusetts or in Vermont or anywhere is essentially the same with the variations that may be driven by local state regulations. And certainly you'll see in the demo in your market there is a lot of behavioral health. Um, special requirements which Ruth will illustrate as well. So we will support that, but the general concept here is that the nation is getting a standardized platform and you folks in Massachusetts are leaders in demonstrating how a whole market moves to this kind of a solution. So exactly how did we look to tackle the problem? Um, as I had said before, roughly, and this is from the last audit result, 49% of directories had these location errors, errors related to the quality. But that's a, that's a huge number, obviously, and definitely tracks to things I'm sure you're all reading in the press these days about directory data quality. What we did is using the CMS data, break down those errors into their component parts because for us to, our, our philosophy on this is, for us to solve this problem, we need to understand the component parts of the problem and see how we address each one of them. So on the left-hand side, the circle, we take that 49% error rate and break out what are the error types. As you can see, 66% of the 50% errors, or the 49% errors, were attributable to the provider not practicing at that location. And again, what's important to remember is how this works. CMS does a secret shopper, shopper audit. They basically, and you as providers probably have no clue if CMS has contacted you through this process because the, the approach is that they are a they represent themselves as a member of a specific plan trying to make an appointment with that provider. They literally are lifting that out of the directories that are being published. So if the response is, like in 66% of the times, this provider is not practicing at this location, is not seeing patients here. That's a huge chunk to address. And you will see how we did that in the demo. The second largest number was inaccurate phone number. And that was 13% of the error rates. And we have addressed that as well. There were some interesting findings around the whole notion of how you ask for the phone number is what it comes down to for the purpose of the phone number. Then uh, the next two were really related to each other, address being incorrect and an incorrect suite number combined. That's 12% uh, of the errors. And the next one was not accepting new patients, um, 4%, and then other is not a bucket we're addressing. So with the solution you're about to see, we are have attempted and have succeeded actually in addressing the problems that are specifically enumerated here, which account for 95% of the error rates um, that have been experienced. So this is the framework and foundation for what we're doing. 
And again, our approach to solving these industry-wide problems really boil down to three things that are required. One is standardizing content. Standardization is critical. Everybody gets the same information and the people supplying it are supplying it once and it gets distributed to many. Okay, so there is standardization in the questions and the responses, eliminating mistakes from there. Obviously, too, by standardizing and doing this one-to-many um, data supplying, and this is really the things that matter most to the providers but also to the payers, is now you are going to be asked to do this once and by being diligent and doing it in this utility, it's going to be distributed to all the people that need it. So as they get comfortable with this and deploy it, and this takes some time, um, but it's already started, you will no longer be getting asked for this redundant information separately. And third is to give you a simple way to submit this. Right now, data is flowing every imaginable way. You have email, you have fax, you have telephone numbers, you have snail mail, you have all sorts of different channels that are not standardized and not consistent to getting this data out. Uh, also another big challenge, but one that what our model tries to address, what our model does is address it, doesn't try, it's actually doing it. Next slide, please. Okay, so I, I referenced before, foundational to doing this was the leveraging of what already exists. This is just a snapshot of ProView. The assumption here, since almost all providers in Massachusetts are already using this underlying platform for their credentialing data submission, there is a high awareness and integration of this process into provider workflows. We're seeing this really work all over the country as well and has become one of, right now we are probably the organization that has the highest utilization for trying to solve for this problem. There are other people attempting to solve for it, but candidly the big barrier to anybody doing this is bullet number one we're already communicating with one and a half million providers. They have a place to go that they know, they trust, and they utilize. So this became a natural springboard. Okay, next um, slide, please. Um, in terms of your local market, because uh, that's really what matters to you, you've got a sense of where we're at. There are already more than 70,000 providers using the ProView system in Massachusetts. Um, that is more than 85% of all of the licensed um, physicians uh, in the state. Um, and that is an important number. We use physicians because getting the other provider types actual counts gets very difficult. There is, no de there is no super accurate denominator, for example, you know, nurses. Uh, there's a lot of nurses that are licensed, but not all of them are participating in networks, what have you. So uh, physicians are a good proxy to give you a sense of penetration. 85% is really a good, strong number. Um, we also have uh, all the major payers in the state already contracted and committed to using this, and we'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, folks are in different stages of implementation, and there will be um, your local, you know, folks, uh, HCAS and the Mass Collaborative and the Medical Society and the Hospital Association will all be working to provide communication and education as this progresses in Massachusetts. So this is really an introduction for you folks. You will be getting over time more and more information as this process progresses and as the payers implement the solution. I will also say that we are also working on some enhancements at the moment, very much driven by your plans in the market defining what they view as important needs to make it even easier for 
the large groups in particular to more efficiently and easily submit data. Um, so you'll be hearing more about that. The, the process is rolling out now because it works. These enhancements will be coming out later this year and throughout 2020 as well. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, obviously, to make this work in the critical part from our perspective uh, is provider engagement. And this is a process that does require, re unlike credentialing, which in, for some of you, you may think of as a once every two year activity, provider data for directories is considerably more dynamic because it's very much about information at the location. We have data that shows that that information changes with great frequency, which is also one of the reasons this has become a problem because it is very difficult for payers to manage these data changes effectively and efficiently because it also involves a lot of communication from the provider, vetting that, is it correct, what do you do with it. So as you'll see when we go through the demo, how this actually will also help the providers clean things up for the payers so that they can manage these directories correctly. The providers are the source of truth for the right data here. Um, next, please. Okay. Again, and you'll see this in the actual um, demonstration, the underlying theory here is a seamless experience for you, consistent and consolidated in terms of how you can get your data to each of the plans you have a relationship with. This model is built on total transparency. You as the providers control your data. This is your data, it's not ours. Um, you manage it, you see who's going to get it, you release it to those entities and you will then have the audit trails and everything else at your end. Your lift is to now manage this in the centralized utility so that all the plans get this data at the same time. With that, hopefully that helped give you an understanding of CAQH's approach to this problem. What we want to now show you is the actual solution, and this is live. What's important to take away from here is that this is not an idea in terms of what we'd like to do. We've already done what you see here and it has been deployed. It's operating for a number of payers in various states. What is different with Massachusetts is that it's a demonstration of how the entire market comes together and coalesces around the solution. We find this incredibly important and I can tell all of you that lots of other states are aware of what you're doing and are looking at this as the model. So with that, I am going to turn it over to my colleague, Ruth, who is actually going to walk you through it and remember those errors in terms of what CMS found because she's actually going to tick them off and show you how each one is being addressed to improve that data quality. Thanks, Soren. Um, as Soren mentioned, I'm Ruth Buenaflor. I am the Client Implementation Manager here at CHUH, working with the health plans in your area for plans that are implementing or plans that are already implemented. Um, as Soren mentioned, we're leveraging the ProView system. So as you see on your screen right now, I am logging into the system as a provider. And as that appears, you'll see the reconciliation box appear upon login. As Soren mentioned, we're passing through the practice locations specifically from health plans. So within the screen, we state here, help patients find you. Health plans have shared practice locations that are not currently in your profile. So upon login, the providers that have new locations will see this reconciliation. And, and I'm jumping in just to clarify a point here because this is one of the new features we've added. Historically, and most of you I'm assuming have had some exposure to ProView, it's been, for lack of a better way of putting it, a one-way street. You supply the data, you authorize its release, and the payers use it for credentialing. What we're doing here to solve that number one problem, the 66% provider not at location, is we said we now have to bring in 
the data that the payers have to build their directories, map that to what is in ProView that the provider has reported, and display to the provider all of the discrepancies, what locations they, the payers have that the provider hasn't reported, and then you will see what the provider can do as a result. So by clicking continue in this reconciliation box, the provider will see addresses that have been shared from various health plans. So amongst the various health plans, two new locations have been submitted on behalf of this provider. Uh, reading from the top, we state here, and we just want to let you all know we're asking, do you practice here? And next to that, we have a learn more FAQ, just in case you want some reference on what we're asking you to do, what happens when you accept a location, what happens when you reject a location, and what happens if there's a typo in the address that's being presented. So ultimately, a health plan is showing you a location, but there may be a, a, a variant. It, instead of suite 100, it may be actually suite 101. So there's some reference here in case you need more info on, on what to answer. So within these locations, we're asking, these locations may appear in health plan directories. Reject locations where you do not practice. So the provider, you have the ability to accept that location or reject the location. If you were to reject the location, you'll see an optional drop-down which states address is incorrect, no longer practice here, never practice here, location is part of my group, or never practice here entered by mistake. So in addition to verifying if the, if the location is in fact active, we're also going to get the granular detail so the health plans can determine, in fact, why this address was rejected in the first place. Um, in addition, there is also the option to select I don't know. So in the case that provider is not clear on that address, if there is something that needs to be referenced, it may be related to a group, you do have that ability to click I don't know. If that is the case, the next time you log into the system, you will see this reconciliation appear again, but it gives you that ability to bypass and answer the remaining questions within ProView that's needed for that point. Um, also, at the bottom of this screen, at the bottom left, you'll see a box that says locations currently in your profile. So in addition to these two new locations, this will show what is currently active on this provider's profile. So as of today, this provider has 60 Newton Street as a current active address with tax ID printed out here, just so you can reference what's already on the profile. So by here, we're gonna accept one location and I'm gonna reject this location for the reason of no longer practice here. After responding to each location, you'll click confirm to move on to the next process. Now that 104 Main Street has been added to my profile, I'll now be required to complete the information directory related specific to this location. So by clicking complete info, you'll see the next step of the reconciliation process appear. So as Soren mentioned with the 66% of provider not practicing at location, the address that was submitted on behalf of that health plan has now appeared. We'll start beginning to ask for the detailed information such as practice name. We're asking this is the practice name that is referenced when a patient calls to make an appointment. Here I'm going to list my main practice. It is a required field, as you can note by the red asterisk. I'm confirming this is, in fact, 104 Main Street. This is Suite 200 in Charleston, Massachusetts. So for this case, I'm going to actually take the zip code off so that you can see our system run its real-time USPS standardization. By clicking Continue, I had physically entered 02128. Well, you'll notice here we're actually suggesting the address you entered has been standardized so that we're confirming and actually validating that against the USPS system. So I'm going to click continue and take the suggested address so that we're normalizing these addresses and you don't have different vari variations of that address amongst the various health plans. So now I'm going to verify. Let me click edit. I'm going to verify the tax ID. Next, I'm going to verify the tax ID. We're asking you as the provider, please specify the practice name as it appears on the W-9. This is an optional field, but we do suggest uh, to enter it if, if available. I'll confirm my tax ID. I am required to specify if this is a group or individual tax ID. And in addition, 
I'll clarify if this is the primary tax ID for the practice location. You do also have the ability to add additional tax IDs if you're operating under multiple tax IDs. By doing the, by clicking the add button, you can add, and there is no limitation on how many tax IDs can be added. This gives a good ability that the health plans can actually consume what your tax IDs or where you're operating at. By this, I'll leave the single ID. I'm going to confirm my tax ID. The next portion is confirming your NPI2. So if you have any group relations, you'll enter the NPI2. If you click yes, you will be required to specify that NPI2. And optional, you can state the group name that's associated. By clicking no, you will not be required to enter a type 2 NPI. And finally is the practice affiliation portion. So in addition to specifying if you're practicing at a location, we're now going to ask for the specific affiliation at that location so the health plans can determine how they want to publish the addresses. So the options here are I see patients here at least one day per week on a regular basis. I see patients here at least one day per month, but less than one day per week on a regular basis. I cover or fill in for colleagues within the same medical group on an as-needed basis. I read tests or provide other services, but I do not see patients at this location, and other. By clicking other, you'll have the ability to add free text if there is a specific affiliation that's not listed here. For this scenario, I'm going to click I see patients here at least one day per week. And once that finalizes, we'll now begin to ask the remaining questions within the error types that Sean had mentioned, things like inaccurate phone number. So now that 104 Main Street has been added to my profile, I'll now fill in the remaining directory required items. So with general, under the general information tab, I'm now being asked to specify my start date at this location, my practice type, if general correspondence can be sent to this location, and then phone number. So under phone number, we'll specifically list to meet provider directory requirements. The phone number entered in the office phone number field must be the number that the patient uses to make an appointment. If the provider does not take appointments, enter the main number for the location. Okay, and this is a good example. When we were working through those CMS problems, we all scratched our heads around the phone number because we, there's a lot of phone numbers out there. What we discovered was that from a provider perspective, when you just ask for phone number, which is how most people were doing it, they were getting what would be an administrative number because from a provider perspective, a plan asking you for a phone number usually connects up to claims or other business transaction issues between you and a payer. Interestingly, by not qualifying what that phone number was for, those administrative numbers were getting published to consumers or to potential your patients to make appointments. And invariably, when the secret shopper went in and used that number, they'd get saying, oh, you, this is the wrong number. You can't call us here to make an appointment. And that would create an error. So what we said is this, and we talked to providers about this, it was really, you need to tell us exactly what it is you need from us. So we realized that part of this problem was being very clear about what we want this phone number, what the purpose of this phone number is. So we see already that we're starting to clean that problem up by just clarifying the question clearly. So once the office number is entered, there is some additional optional information on the general tab that can be entered, such as insure information in some of your local plans. If you want to add your provider, provider numbers, and then some provider directory questions. At the bottom, I'll click save and continue. And then from a directory perspective, I'm going to complete the remaining information associated with this location. So the next phase after general information is the health plan participation. So for each health plan that has an association to you, it'll be listed here under the health plan participation portion, and you'll specify here in what Soren had mentioned in the, um, you know, to av avoid provider abrasion, we're going to answer these questions specifically in one area. So on behalf of what you're seeing here, Aetna, 
a demo health plan and United is going to capture this information on behalf of this provider. I'm going to specify, do you participate with any products or plans on behalf of this health plan at this location? By clicking yes, you'll be required to specify if you're also accepting new patients on behalf of this health plan. So for this, I'm going to select yes and no for United. Once I click Save and Continue, this will take me to the next portion, which is the hours associated to the practice location. So practice office hours, we'll specify here at the top, please enter the office hours for the practice location, not the practitioner. So this should be the hours posted where I can call and make an appointment at that same phone number. So here you can list out if I'm accepting phone calls from seven to five on Monday, Monday through Wednesday. I can enter this here. And then some optional items, average wait times, wait time for appointments, and some additional optional information that's included under the hours tab. Next, I'll move to the coverage and contact portion. This will capture some of the additional information, such as any associates or partners, as well as billing and office manager information gives a good ability for the health plan to capture some additional information at the service location level. So starting from the top, do you have any partners or associates at this location? By clicking yes, you'll be required to enter those partners or associates. By clicking no, there are no additional fields that will need to be included. Also here, we will require the office manager to be entered so that the health plan can gather that data. There is also some additional information, appointment secretary, billing contact, and payment and remittance info, which is optional as well to provide to the health plan. Next after coverage and contact is practice locations, specifically at the service location level. So practice limitations, here's where we'll capture at the service location level any limitations such as gender, age, or any other limitations that want to be specified for that location. By clicking yes to gender limitations, you'll be required to specify if it's female only, male only, or none. Age limitations, by clicking yes, you'll enter an age minimum and age maximum for that location. And then any other limitations is open to free text. By clicking save and continue, this will take me to the accessibility tab. So these are ADA and handicap accessibility specific items. Um, first question is, does this office meet ADA accessibility requirements? Does this office provide handicap accessibility? And then the ability to specify how the location meets handicap accessibility requirements. You can specify there's access exterior and interior, as well as specifying access to gurneys and stretchers. And then finally, is the office accessible by public transportation? And do you have hearing impaired devices available at that location? And then the final portion specific at the practice location level is any additional services that you may want to share with the health plan, which will include things like radiology, anesthesiology, as well as non-English languages and interpreters at the location. I believe just recapping the breakdown of errors, so far we've covered provider not practicing at locations, we can confirm that. The inaccurate phone number, address incorrect, Incorrect suite number is captured via the USPS standardization during the acceptance of that practice location, and then not accepting new patients. That we're capturing at the service location as well as at the specific health plan level. And finally, I'll just run through the special services. It's the connection, then, because we can't get out of the development. Yeah, I believe so, and let me just move over. I can do is okay. While well, she's double checking at how we can get out of that because we think we just had a connection glitch, um, there were a couple of questions. Uh, actually, I'm seeing one, and I hope you all are using the uh, question capability if you're interested. Um, must seem to be housekeeping, uh, but there is one uh, from a, I assume, an individual provider, and the question is. Does this affect me as an out-of-network, part-time, solo practitioner, bracket child and adolescent psychiatrist who does not use an electronic health record? So the short answer is no, it does not affect you. 
because if you are not in a provide in a payer network, you would not be published for um, a directory. However, you do have the ability, if you so choose, to be able to self-register in the system if you want to have your data in an electronic form like this, and should you in the future consider participating in a payer network. So again, what we're solving for are network-based providers that have relationships contractually with payers and get published in directories. The problem has been that the contact information, the location information, all the things that you heard um, Ruth go through um, are not always accurate. So short answer for this provider is you don't have to use it, but you can certainly register and try it out. Uh, I see another question has come in. How about behavioral health facilities? Are they included in this? Would they do a similar survey? So the facilities itself are the location um, where services rendered. We are looking at the future having data for that, but most of the directories and the issues we're solving for now are the individual practitioners. A, a, a patient does not make an appointment with a facility they make an appointment with a provider at a facility. So it's important to start with the provider. We do capture the affiliations of those facilities with providers, but the driver is the individual provider, practitioner, clinician working at a given location. And you can have an individual working at multiple locations and not all locations have contracts with all the same payers. So it is a rather complex set of relationships. But the short answer to that question is it's not driven at the facility level. Oh, great question here. Uh, what is the percent of the data that is correct currently in CAQH as it compares to the data analysis shown from CMS? What we have done is we have actually had some of the early adopter plans uh, conduct pilots. One of the pilots we did was in Texas. And what it did was basically they ran their provider network in Texas through this process and then conducted a CMS-like audit. So they pretended they were doing what CMS would do to check what the improvement was. I can tell you that the plan was roughly in that 50% error rate, and this was a six-month study, and at the end of that, the and this is a national plan that did this, their data accuracy, the way CMS would measure it, improved to 84%, okay? Which from their perspective was great because that puts them into sort of the green zone of how CMS is looking at this. And obviously, as we continue to iterate on this and improve some of the processes, it gets better and better um, on this. Uh, we also have uh, HCAS on the line who can also respond uh, to questions. Um, and certainly, they would be in the best position um, to answer plan-specific questions. Yep, and actually, Soren, I'll just chime in. I think it was something I had opened in the system, so it slowed me down. Just as a final, so we have the services tab open, and I'll just recap the final portions of this for the providers. Under that special services tab, you can specify additional services, such as laboratory, CLIA certificate, radiology, and at the very bottom, which we find one of the important things that plans are starting to publish on providers' behalf, are any interpretation services. Non-English non languages spoken by office personnel, and there is no limitation to the languages that can be entered. Then you can specify the employee type that offers that language, in addition to any interpreters that offer a language at the location. And finally, once I click Save and Continue, I can complete my attestation by clicking Review and Attest at the very top. 
And once I click View Errors, the system will take a summary of general info that may be missing or any required fixes. <clears throat> excuse me, that may have been missed during the attestation. So here I'll complete general country, and the scrubber will pick up anything that's needed before an attestation can go through to a health plan. And the final item, as a final checkpoint before a provider can attest, will run the practice location phone numbers through. So you'll notice earlier during the main practice, I entered this new phone number. <clears throat> so we're gonna ask the providers to confirm if this is in fact the number that a patient can call to make an appointment. Once I click confirm, this will finalize my attestation. I can click here to attest. And as a final recap, we offer the directory data summary, which will show the providers. You can see a recap of everything you've attested to, which is going to be shared on behalf of health plans. So here is a summary of my provider profile, my education, my specialties, my practice locations with any group affiliations, office hours, the plans that I'm accepting on behalf of, and then finally, any affiliations. So in addition to my practice locations, I'll have any hospital affiliations that I may have. And that, once you complete this, by clicking a test, your information will be shared amongst the various health plans. And that is basically a recap of accepting or reconciling the location and then providing the directory related information to those active locations. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, hopefully you folks uh, have got a sense of what this is about. Um, I'm looking uh, at timing here, um, and I think um, we are looking to see what QA um, might be needed, and also to uh, see the next piece of this, which is to give you a sense of how the workflow would actually go. So you've seen a lot of the technology and the uh, support of the system, but included in this is that uh, outreach, which is probably one of your annoyances as providers. As I had mentioned before, the frequency of outreach is dictated by the regulators, um, and it is every 90 days, and they do also want to audit the payers for being consistent with that outreach. So what we do in the system is we try to consolidate that on behalf of all of the participating organizations so the outreach occurs for all of them through this one touch. So that will certainly reduce it. What you will experience though in terms of outreach is through the system, through email outreach, which is why that's important to provide, and then also, for the first time, we will have outbound phone support for providers that um, have not responded to the prompts to do the updates. What the system does in all of this is um, also then produce the compliance reports that the outreach occurred, when it occurred, who did it occur for, and what the results of the outreach were. So we're also wrapping in the compliance requirements and doing it in the easiest way possible for you guys because obviously the abrasion here would be huge if everybody was doing this on their own. Yeah, actually, Thorne, I think uh, speaking of abrasion, there's a great question or statement here um, that says by updating the information through Direct Assure, phone numbers through the health plans partnering with Direct Assure will no longer call the practices directly. Uh, that is actually one of the benefits with Direct Assure yeah. is we're trying to avoid the multiple phone calls on behalf of those health plans so we can capture this directly through the portal. That's correct. And that is absolutely one of the goals. I do want to just for from a reality check perspective, in the beginning, I we know already from the pilot experience and stuff that plans will still check in until there's high confidence that the full process is working. So what you will see is a diminishing set of calls, ultimately really in the perfect scenario, elimination of them, because they will not want to do it anymore. Calling you from the plan perspective is, it's not what they want to be doing if they don't have to do it. So this works for everybody. It's an irritant and abrasion to you 
it is high cost and process to the payer. So solutions like this try to get at the heart of that. Um, okay, we have some more questions here. Also, again, we have uh, Lori Virgil on from HCAS. They have been instrumental. HCAS, for those that may not know, is the consortium, the organization that the payers in your market, Tufts, um, Harvard, what have you, um, utilize to work with us so that they can all basically get their messages across clearly and consistently to us. We work very closely with them. And they will be running and be on point with, I assume, the Medical Society and the Hospital Association and all the other stakeholders in your market to roll out more communication, education. We're committed and have dedicated staff at our end to support this process. So um, it is really, as I said, uh, a lot of eyes, not only in Massachusetts, but throughout the country are on what is happening in your market today. So um, it's all really good. There are now lots of questions flowing in, and I am a little concerned with our time. So what we will do, and since this was the second presentation, and we had a lot of questions from the first one. We are going to consolidate the questions from both sessions and then push this out to you folks, to everyone. Uh, it will be made available so you will see the questions and our responses. Um, you will also have availability of this presentation um, that we've done as a recording, I believe. Um, so you'll be able to tap it on our website. Uh, we certainly encourage you to um, share it amongst your own folks, have others attend. And I don't know, is it on our website or is it? We'll, we'll go ahead and email it to everyone that registered um, for the uh, webinar. Oh, okay. But I, I think there's also a YouTube somewhere, I thought. I yeah, yeah, right. we'll send out a link to the Right. Website. There's yeah. a link that we'll send to you. So it's not on our website, but it's tied to it, I guess, to be able to see this. And you can share the link with your colleagues and others. And obviously, if there are more questions, we will be more than happy to answer them. Um, the goal here is to begin that education process, as I said at the beginning. You folks are the critical component to making this work. The payers are aligned. They are working really hard. And I do need to say this, and if I, I'm sure Lori will say it many times over, but I can see that the plans are making a huge investment in this because realize this is a lot of data flowing and we're cleaning up a lot of data. So they are making enormous investments um, in their IT and their infrastructure to support this process, all with the goal of reducing the abrasion and improving the quality of this problem. So um, again, it's, it's an exciting time. I think we have a, a really good path forward on this. And we are here to um, support this uh, in every way possible. So I believe with that, we are now at time as well. So thank you all for attending here. Thank you to all the local constituents and stakeholders that have made this possible, HCAS, the Medical Society, the Hospital Association, um, all are involved in trying to make this a really successful demonstration for the whole country. So thank you all for attending, and we look forward to questions and working with you.